Hello, welcome to my library. I've been looking over a copy of James Fetimore Cooper's The Oak Openings, or The Bee Hunter, as he called it. And this is a pretty good place to start with a discussion of the literature of Kalamazoo County because this particular book was the first novel written about this region. Cooper wrote it in 1848, and uh, it wasn't one of his best sellers. It's actually uh, referred to by critics as one of his worst books. But it's very it's a fun book, and it is set in the Kalamazoo River Valley. It's set in Prairie Rond, and they have adventures in the Kalamazoo River and go all the way down to Saugatuck. Now, Cooper owned land in Kalamazoo and actually came here and did some of the research. But I want to read you the inscription that I found inside this particular volume. This was presented to Theodore on Christmas 1918 by his father. The author wrote this book at the Old Walker Tavern at what is now Cambridge Junction of the Old Chicago Turnpike, etc. Well, it's interesting because people in Schoolcraft also claim that uh, Cooper wrote his novel there. People in Comstock claim also, and there are several different communities in Michigan that claim that uh, James Fettermore Cooper wrote Oak Openings there. Well, if we examine his uh, travel notes and his diaries, we find out that he wrote it back home in Cooperstown, New York. So there, it's disappointing. Needless to say, it is a very good novel, nevertheless, and worth reading. Now, there were other people that took that same idea of using uh, uh, a setting in uh, round school craft with Buzzing Ben, the bee hunter, and some other local characters, Basil Harrison. Frederick H. Britton in 1910 published Teddy, which was a book using almost the same plot as Cooper. It's not quite as well a written book, but it is set in the area and it's worth taking a look at. Britton was a native of Detroit. He lived there from around the turn of the century until 1910 when this was published, and then he moved away from Detroit. Now, this is something we're going to find out. It's a theme running through the literature of Kalamazoo County. When people write something about Kalamazoo, they either disappear shortly thereafter or else they were born in Kalamazoo and left before they wrote anything significant. We had a few authors that stayed within the community. Flavius Littlejohn was a native of Allegan, and he was an early circuit court judge and a surveyor and uh, uh, different occupations. He wrote a book published in 1876 called Legends of Michigan and the Old Northwest, and it was tales that he collected as he made his rounds as a circuit court judge, many of which are set in Kalamazoo in Schoolcraft area, for example, and uh, it's a very interesting book, credited as being very truthful. Now, another author, a woman author, at the turn of the century, was Carolyn Abbott Stanley. She came to Kalamazoo in the late 1870s and stayed here as principal of the local high school until about 1896, when, as her biography says, she left teaching for literary work. She moved out to Washington, D.C., and wrote a series of uh, very interesting novels, novels that were bestsellers at the time. Order Number 11 was one. A Modern Madonna was another one of her better-known works. I just recently found out about her, and so I haven't acquired a copy of her works yet, but I do have a manuscript for a short story that she wrote around World War I time called Mrs. Cram's Bond. And so that's all I can show you as far as she's concerned, but I'm still looking for some more of her books. Will Levington Comfort was born in Kalamazoo in the 1880s, uh, although his autobiography states that his earliest reminiscences, recollections, are of Detroit. So he moved out of Kalamazoo very, uh, as a, at a very young age. He went on to serve as a war correspondent in the Spanish-American War and the Russo-Japanese War, and he wrote Rutledge Rides Alone, which was uh, a very successful novel. Uh, he wrote several other novels up until about 1920, uh, when he died at a rather young age. Alexander Corky was another author who lived in Kalamazoo for five or six years. He was a student at Kalamazoo College, and he also uh, was a local minister. After he moved out of Kalamazoo, he wrote The Victory of Alan Rutledge, as well as several other interesting volumes. You start to see the trend. They write, 
interesting books and then move away. Now, I, I haven't quite figured out why this happens. Here's a very uh, bizarre book called Onar, and it was written by Edwin Faxon Osborne, who I've researched in the directories as being a local minister. This was published in Kalamazoo in 1910, that same year that Osborne mysteriously disappears out of the Kalamazoo City Directory. The book, in fact, deals with spiritualism, uh, adventures he had in northern Michigan with a spirit lady. And of course, probably the most famous author this, that was born in Kalamazoo was Edna Ferber. She uh, was born in Kalamazoo uh, and left at the age of three. The family moved elsewhere. And she wrote a long string of very successful novels, uh, So Big, Showboat, etc. Not once did she ever mention Kalamazoo in her works, unfortunately. But her autobiography does show an illustration of the house where she was born in Kalamazoo. So at least she remembered that. Now, there were also some authors of well-known children's books. Lucy Fitch Perkins came to Kalamazoo as a teenager and uh, graduated from the Kalamazoo High School around 1882 and later, again, moved away for her higher education. But she launched a series of very successful children's books called the Twin Series. This is the Belgian Twins. There were the Eskimo Twins, the Scotch Twins, the Irish Twins. There was about 30 different series of Twins books that were bestsellers for children from the period around 1900 into the 20s. And one uh, final children's author that uh, I enjoy is Genevieve Cross, who wrote The Engine That Lost Its Whistle. This was published in the 1940s, and this is about the train that ran on the Fruit Belt Line that ran between Kalamazoo and South Haven. And it's a charming story for children about the little engine and how it lost its whistle and how it got it back. So as you see, there were several authors of pretty good fiction that hailed from this area, and a few even wrote about Kalamazoo. There were also a larger number of rhymers who chose Kalamazoo to write about. But before we look at some of those rhymers, I thought maybe you'd enjoy listening to a little bit of music on my old wind-up Victrola. <clears throat> this Victrola was made around 1910, and it's one that is completely hand-operated before electricity. So before you play each record, you have to spend a little manual labor. And you give it a good wind. You open up the door. It gives you the volume. Release the brake. Put your needle down by hand. And listen to the strains of the House of David Blues. <laughs> <laughs> 
was the House of David Blues in honor of the House of David in Benton Harbor, a religious cult that sported long hair and had a, one of the hairiest baseball teams on record. I also have an, a recording of uh, Edgar Guest reading his own poetry. Now, Edgar Guest is uh, probably one of Michigan's better known poems, wrote for the Detroit area around the turn of the century up and through the 20s. But instead of playing that, I think I'd like to share with you some poems that have been written about Kalamazoo. Now, probably the most famous poet to write about Kalamazoo was Carl Sandburg. This is the first edition of Smoke and Steel that was published in 1920. And in it, we find the sins of Kalamazoo. The sins of Kalamazoo are neither scarlet nor crimson. The sins of Kalamazoo are a convict gray, a dishwater drab. And the people who sin the sins of Kalamazoo are neither scarlet nor crimson. They run to drabs and grays. And some of them sing, they shall be washed whiter than snow, and some we should worry. Now, as you can imagine, the poem was not particularly popular in Kalamazoo because it uh, was rather negative. Kalamazoo, perhaps because of its euphonious name, became very popular with a variety of poets. Another nationally known uh, poet, uh, Vachel Lindsay, the tramp poet who wandered around the countryside uh, selling his poems for food and a place to sleep, wrote, Kalamazoo, once in the city of Kalamazoo, the gods went walking two and two with the friendly phoenix, the stars of Orion, the speaking pony, and singing lion, etc. That was more favorable to Kalamazoo, and Vachel Lindsay did indeed come to Kalamazoo in the 1920s and give a concert of his readings. And uh, another well-known poet, uh, Arthur Getterman, who wrote a lot of humorous poetry, and this happens to be The Mirthful Liar, wrote a, so a poem about Kalamazoo that goes, her founder's name was Bronson, so thus they named the town, instead of Jenkins Johnson or Smith or Jones or Brown. But when her realm expanded and trumpet sounded fame, repeatedly demanded a more sonorous name, they christened her anew, Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo. Her glory ever grew, Kalamazoo. So we get a little history lesson in this particular poem about the fact that Kalamazoo originally was named Bronson after Titus Bronson. Well, uh, there were local poets who also chose to write about Kalamazoo. The earliest printed poem about Kalamazoo that I've come across uh, was put in print in 1855 when the Ladies Library Association published a quarter centennial celebration of the settlement of Kalamazoo. And this includes a poem by E. Lakin Brown, who is from Schoolcraft. And it's a very long uh, poem that lacks too much poetic appeal, but he again gets into the history of the area, and so that I think is worth saving and possibly worth reading for that fact. E. Lakin Brown also uh, wrote a later poem that's included in a, a city directory for uh, 1868 called Prairie Rond at Harvest Time. And I think uh, over that uh, 10 year period, his poetry improved because rather than the classical type poetry, we find him describing the place that he knew so well, Prairie Rond. Know ye aught of Prairie Rond, where it is and where it is found? Tis the very biggest prairie, twixt St. Joe and Sault St. Mary. Tis a broad and fertile plain where the farmer raises grain by gay green wood surrounded, by leafy rim adorned and bounded, etc. Well, other poets came along. Uh, another rather well-known poet was uh, Asa Stoddard, who hailed from um, <coughs> Comstock area and later moved to, uh, oh, the, he was known as the farmer poet and he moved to Cooper. Now, one of his better poems is descriptive of the plank road that ran between Kalamazoo and Grand Rapids and it's called Riding on the Plank. Did you ever, friend or stranger, let me ask you free and frank, brave the peril, dare the danger of a journey on the plank? Ever see the wild commotion, hear the clatter, din and clank, feel the quick electric motion caused by riding on the plank, etc. And of course, it was a very rough ride riding on that plank road, as you can imagine, jarring people. Uh, probably Kalamazoo's poet that uh, achieved the most notoriety in the late 19th century, uh, hailed from the Galesburg area. His name was Bert Smiley. 
Uh, he graduated from Kalamazoo High School around 1879 and launched a poetic career. Uh, he wrote thousands of poems. It seemed that he could dash out a po off a poem about almost any topic that came to mind. The problem was he was very sarcastic, and he chastised people, his neighbors, anyone he met. If he was jilted by a girlfriend, he wrote a nasty poem about her and put it in the print. Uh, as an example of his poetry, this was his first book, Meditations of Samuel Wilkins. We find My Mother's Cookies. How dear to this heart is the clear recollection of Saturday bakings when I was a child. How I watched the proceedings with keenest inspection and danced round the table in ecstasy wild. But nearer than all the nice things they were making and watched with the most unaccountable greed were the cookies that formed the last part of the baking. My mother's white cookies with caraway seed, those white sugar cookies, my mother's new cookie, best cookies, those dear little cookies with caraway seed. Well, you can see why he got a local notoriety, but perhaps not national fame as a result of his poetry. He went on to publish in 1888, A Basket of Chips. And here we see the more sarcastic side of Smiley. He writes a poem about Kalamazoo, in which he goes around the town describing things. The Michigan Insane Asylum is up on the top of the hill, and some irresponsible crazies meander around at their will, and they frequently talk to a stranger, and they sometimes escape, it is true, but the folks are not all of them crazy that who hail from fair Kalamazoo. Well, Smiley got into trouble with the local people, particularly in Galesburg. He ran the newspaper, the Galesburg Argus over there, and uh, almost got run out of town because in each issue of the newspaper he would highlight somebody to uh, write a rather nasty poem about. Uh, his final book was called Nora, A Michigan Story of 1893. He came to a bad end. He committed suicide shortly after the turn of the century. Now there was another rhymer who uh, lived in Climax, Climax Frank Hodgman. And uh, Hodgman was a pioneer, had come in the 1830s and had been a surveyor and had done a number of interesting occupations, but he turned to poetry in his later years and he crossed swords, or pens at least, with Dwight Smiley. Uh, and he wrote, they wrote poetry back and forth in the newspapers attacking each other, who was the best poetry, etc. This is a sample of uh, Hodgman's work called Our Village, which is descriptive of Climax. There's a snug little village that's built on a plain where the iron horse daily rolls by with his train, where the churches are pointing their spires to the sky to show us the road to the mansions on high, etc. Well, he was a fairly interesting poet. Now, there was another person named Smiley that uh, lived in the area. He was Howard Dwight Smiley, no relation to Bert Smiley. He wrote The Old Stamping Grounds and other poems. It seems that he was a young man and uh, had gone up to the Klondike, and while he was up there, he, this was the gold rush of 1898, he learned that his parents had died and he rushed home but found out that he couldn't get a settlement on the will, and so he was bereft of funds. So all he had left to live in was a little boathouse out on Gull Lake, and he spent his summers out there and became known as the Wizard of the Shack because he lived in this little boathouse and had a coterie of friends that came to listen to his poetry, including one he wrote about Gull Lake. Green grow your banks, O bonny gull, upon your peaceful breast. The music of your wavelet lulls all nature into rest. Among your trees the robin trills his little song of love, while in your bushes coos and bills the gentle morning dove. Well, that was his one and only book, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I guess, uh, as you may prefer to think. Poems for Odd Fellows and Rebecca's was published in Kalamazoo in 1898, uh, written by a man named S Slater. And uh, we occasionally find an interesting poem within uh, the, the book. For example, when Adam was a kid, there ain't much fun in living now for little kids like me because everybody's down on us and folks won't let us be. It didn't used to be that way when Adam was a kid. He wasn't bully ragged and jawed for everything he did. He didn't have to go to church and Sunday school and such, nor wash himself, nor brush his hair, nor sit up straight, not much. He done whatever he'd a mind, for nothing was forbid. You bet that boys had jolly times when Adam was a kid. Well, it's very reminiscent of James Whitcomb Riley, the great Hoosier poet. 
And then in the uh, 20th century, we find other poems who continue to put these little books of verse together. Usually they were published via the vanity press. That means that they paid to have them produced. No one would dare take that, uh, the desire to publish that on their own because uh, usually they were left with most of them as remainders. They didn't sell well. We found Aletha Phillips Spore, Other Ways and Other Days, published in 1928, and an example of her poetry, The Melon Patch. Back of the cabin with a roof of thatch was planted a three-acre melon patch where we always went in the early fall after a heated game of ball and ate our fill of the luscious fruit. But when the owner appeared, we'd scoot down through the field and over the fence, rudely laughing at his expense. And of course, you can imagine what happened in the rest of the poem. The owner came out and sicked the dog on him and got poor Aletha. Finally, the Nixie Box by Earl L. Newton, published in the 1920s in Kalamazoo. Newton was an employee of the post office and turned when he wasn't filing letters or delivering them to writing poetry. And his poetry is reminiscent of Robert W. Service, the great uh, uh, writer that wrote about Alaska in the Northwest. This particular poem is entitled, Tell Me Brother, Did You Ever Have a Cinder in Your Eye? When I hear a man complaining of the grief and pain and care that have filled his life with hardship that have fallen to his share, when I hear him growl and grumble and rebel against the row that the cruel hand of destiny has given him to hoe, when I always feel like saying to that poor lamenting guide, tell me, brother, did you ever have a cinder in your eye? So I guess you're supposed to feel better because of that. Well, this is a sample of some of the uh, unusual poetry that has been written about Kalamazoo and has been written by Kalamazooans. There's much more out there and I think it would behoove anyone that's interested in the past to take a look at the, your local library or at the library at Western Michigan University and explore some of these novels, poetry, even children's books about our area. It's worth the reading.